This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Martin James, Jim Hart, David Musher, and our new patrons helping get us to our goal, Peter, Caleb, Mild Coffee, and John. On this episode of DTNS, goodbye, Stitcher. Will podcasters miss you? Google kills its AR headset, but it may be making a smarter move. And baseball's hottest new scout is AI. That kid has a great arm. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, June 28th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from studio, I don't even know where. I'm Sarah Lane. Just south of the Great Salt Lake, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Jane. Oh, my friends, if you're not a patron, you're going to want to be a patron for the extended show today. We got lots of cool stuff to talk about, but let's start with the quick hits. OpenAI updated its ChatGPT apps to add a new browsing feature for ChatGPT Plus subscribers. The feature lets ChatGPT search Bing for answers. And since ChatGPT's training data cuts off in 2021, this lets the chatbot deliver current information. A couple of notable governmental developments in the European Union. The European Commission published plans for legislation regarding a central bank digital currency, the old CBDC. Haven't heard about that in a minute. The legislation would smooth the way for the European Central Bank, the ECB, to develop a digital euro. Also, Tuesday, the European Parliament and the European Council agreed on the final form of the Data Act. That's the act that will govern how companies handle European consumer data, including safeguards against non-EU countries accessing it. Among other things, the act makes it easier to switch providers of data storage. So if you wanted to switch from Apple iCloud to Google Cloud Services. The act now needs formal approval by the Council and the Parliament, which is expected to happen pretty soon, and then it will go into effect 20 months after passage. So you're not going to hear about it again anytime soon. <laughs> Talk to you in 20 months. Yeah. Proton released Proton Pass, its end to end encrypted password manager, announced back in April. Proton Pass is available as a browser extension, also as an app on Android and iOS. The company plans to open source it so independent researchers can audit its code. A basic version with multi device support is available for free, while subscribers get two factor authentication support and also unlimited email aliases. Joby Aviation received a special airworthiness certificate. That's what it's called, the special airworthiness certificate from the Federal Aviation Administration in the U.S. for its production prototype electric vehicle takeoff and landing vehicle, an eVTOL. This vehicle will be deployed at Edwards Air Force Base in 2024, although it still needs to secure military airworthiness certification. It's special, but it's not military yet. The latest certification helps Joby make progress in the FAA's type certification process, and it's on track to be able to deliver its first eVTOL aircraft to a customer by 2024 and commercialize air taxi service by 2025. DoorDash added the ability for couriers to opt into an earn by time feature, which would offer a guaranteed hourly minimum rate for making deliveries. The option won't be available on all deliveries and couriers still can receive tips from customers. Other updates for couriers include a feature to share real-time location with up to five contacts and a dash along the way feature where couriers can pick up orders on the way to a destination. Oh, I love these uh, Silicon Valley companies innovating with payments. So you pay by hour. Wow. That's so, <laughs> so interesting. Mm, yeah. Reinventing the wheel. Uh, Sirius XM, the satellite radio service that is also available online, uh, but usually comes free with that expensive car you bought, uh, acquired the podcasting app maker Stitcher. Back in 2020, y'all know Stitcher. They've been around forever since like 2008. Uh, but now Sirius XM is shutting down Stitcher. That's right. You have until August 29th, if you use Stitcher, to move to a new podcast listening platform. Sirius XM is incorporating podcasting into its main service. So they're kind of hoping you'll just head over to Sirius XM and use that. Get all the radio stuff, get the podcasts, etc. Stitcher Studios and Earwolf Comedy Network are going to continue producing shows, so they're not shutting down that part of the operation, just the app. Uh, Stitcher also had some shows you had to pay for in a premium service, uh, and each of those shows will decide where they're going to end up on their own. They're not moving to Sirius XM necessarily. Um, 
Man, it feels like Stitcher's been with us forever. It's it's been 15 years. Scott, are you going to miss it? Uh, sir, no, I will not miss <laughs> Stitcher. Um, look, you ask a bunch of you ask a room full of podcasters how they feel about Stitcher, and you're probably going to get a different variety of answers. But um, I was always a little bit hung up on the way that they did business. Uh, I love podcasting when it's embraced as the open form that it is. I just like that there's RSS feeds, and if you have a cool player, then people will gravitate to it because the player's cool. And you can earn their trust that way. I never really liked their uh, their way of trying to get podcasts to opt into their program, and uh, never really trusted the fine print. So, uh, to be honest, they they were never much of a force for me when, in creation, and they were never able to get me to to use it as even just a listener experience. It just never worked for me. My biggest problem, though, is the the quality of the audio would always take a hit. You, you may post your show at 128 KPBS or something, but it would show up in Stitcher way less than that um, and, and it had issues like that. But all of that being said, it's a name that was recognizable and that we all remember from those days. And so a little piece of me is sad that it's not there anymore, but I didn't ever like it in the first place. <laughs> well, and, you know, and maybe that's, that's you know, us coming from the podcast production standpoint. I know a lot of podcast listeners who preferred Stitcher over all other options, not necessarily because they tried a hundred different options, but um, I have set up many a podcast feed over the years as we all have. Um, and anytime Stitcher was either neglected or just left out entirely, I would get angry uh, messages from people being like, well, what about Stitcher? I use Stitcher. <laughs> and I, you know, okay, all right, well, we, we'll set up that feed. I mean, I, that was I, never I, I, like a huge problem for me to do, but um, Stitcher has a lot of fans. I had a templated response for that because Stitcher wanted you as a podcast to uh, to agree to their terms to carry you. And one of those terms in there was that you would put Stitcher promotions in your show. And I was like, no, it's a freely available RSS. You just carry it. So it would always be delayed for them to pick up my shows because I would never agree to those terms of service. So I would get those same things of like, why aren't you on Stitcher? And I would say, well, I don't know. Ask Stitcher. They can add me whenever they want. Uh -huh. Yeah. And they usually did after. Um, yeah, they would. I did similar things and they would they would eventually get you in there because the fan demand was there. But I got to say, in the last few years, I those requests went away. Like Sarah's right. There was a time there yeah, where everybody after was took over. I think yeah. they, they, they cleaned up the operation and made it a little more typical. That also kind of coincided with, with Spotify's rise as the new popular kid yeah. on the block in terms of listenership. And so I think maybe some of that just shifted. But and I, even know, Spotify yeah. just accepted RSS feeds, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, still does. Spotify also is going through a little bit of its own restructuring yeah, where okay. Spotify originals, um, not that they're not working, um, but they're not working across the board. Um, and it sounds like Stitcher has been having some of those same issues, uh, not necessarily getting the traction by, you know, robbing people of other options, you know, to get the podcast. This is also... Tom, you mentioned Sirius XM, uh, a thing that you get when you buy an expensive car. I I had, yeah, like two years or some, something crazy when I had leased my now current car. And I was like, this is great. I will totally pay for this once it runs out. Did not happen uh, uh -huh. because I pay for Apple Music and, eh, you know, podcast, whatever. I, you know, I'm busy. But uh, but I, I feel like the serious play of saying Stitcher is going away. If you want some of the stuff, you know, take another look at us. They're, they're going to get some signups. I don't know how many, um, but that's kind of their business model, right? Yeah. We're, we're in the, the weird down cycle of the podcast booms that, that happen over and over and over again that we've all been through multiple times. And it is interesting to see Sirius XM just shut down a platform instead of modify it and say, you know what, we've got podcast in the Sirius XM app come there. Uh, this this is a fairly abrupt, uh, I mean, they're giving you a month or so, but it's a, a couple of months, fairly abrupt way of, of doing it. And it doesn't feel like they're saying we will transition you to Sirius XM. They're saying you you have until then to pick whatever podcast platform you want. So it's not, it's not a hard sell. And I think that's because they don't see podcasting as urgent to their mm. to their strategy, mm -hmm. but complementary to their strategy. I, I originally saw the acquisition as them buying a user base, and that would just immediately pump up yeah. their chances right. of doing something. But what makes me 
question that assumption is that that because this is so abrupt and so sudden and they're not automatically transitioning transitioning people that to me feels like maybe they maybe they did intend it to bring over a big user base it just didn't pan out and they want to get out from under it they've got their own plans like who knows? I don't know anyone who's going serious XM and podcast. Sign me up. Like no one, no one's j- jazzed about that. But if you're a serious XM user and you're yeah. already in the ecosystem, why not? It's like so. the podcast in the Audible app. People yeah. are like, "Oh, I didn't know those were there." Kind of yep. thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or YouTube, they do the same thing. Yeah. Mm. Well, you might have forgotten about Google Glass, but never Google Glass, arguably <laughs> the first victim of being before its augmented reality time. Mm. However. Google didn't really stop innovating when that particular product failed. We may have a new setback, though. Business Insider reports that the company recently killed an augmented reality project internally known as Iris after several years, in part due to waves of layoffs and company reshuffles over the past few months. So Google is not alone in that whole let's figure out how the company is going forward tech thing. But there's also been talk of internal lack of direction on IRS, which might be why Clay Bavor, the company's former chief of augmented and virtual reality, also just left Google to work on a startup with Salesforce co-CEO Brett Taylor. So, Tom, uh, what's a little more? more context here. Yeah. So uh, you you may remember The Verge reporting about Iris uh, more than a year ago, saying Google was going to launch it in 2024. That's not going to happen now. Uh, the Iris AR glasses were supposed to look like a pair of glasses, inconspicuous. Just you're wearing them like I'm wearing glasses right now. And there was definitely work being done. Uh, you probably, if you remember anything about them at all, remember that they demoed them at IO last year in a video showing real-time translation. So there was a woman uh, speaking Mandarin and another woman listening, and then the glasses were translating the Mandarin into English uh, in real time. So that's not going to happen. That is, uh, put that on your your next top five vaporware from IO list, Tom, because we're not getting these. What is going to happen now? It may be shutting down the hardware development, but Google has been working on an Android for AR platform, and it's going to ramp that up faster. It's building Android XR already for Samsung's extended reality wearable devices. And Insider says a new platform called Micro XR uh, for glasses probably was being made for Iris is now just going to be made for everybody. And I don't know, Scott, that feels like the right thing for Google to do, no? It feel, yeah, it's hard to call it a pivot because they were, you know, like you said, they were already in mid-development or working on this stuff anyway. It seems very Google, though, to say, all right, look, we made an attempt or a stab at our being the focus of hardware. Maybe we we do the Android way, which is, sure, we've got our own phones, but we're uh, we're mostly putting this out there so that other uh, devices and, and, and the licenses can happen under our... Uh, you know, under our leadership and, and we're going to maintain this and make it awesome and keep updating it and, and all of that. That's one place where you could argue nobody in the market is that yet. Most everybody is like, well, we want the headset and the experience, whether you're talking VR, AR, or some combination of, of both for them to say, well, what if we really made a platform that was world-class and then anybody who wants to make an AR uh, hardware approach they have the platform already. We've done half the, it's just like phones. It's the same process. So I think this just fits into their, into their MO. Why wouldn't they do this? I'm a little surprised they didn't throw all their guts at it already. Be honest. Yeah. I mean, you know, for anyone who's like, well, you know, Google does make hardware. Indeed they do. Um, You know, look at the pixel phone line, uh, very beloved uh, by those who use it. Um, But you know, the Android ecosystem largely has thrived on everybody else. And Google saying, go forth, young men and women and everybody in between and, you know, and and make stuff. And we're going to, you know, we're going to be, you know, at the core of this. I think that the whole glasses thing, I keep wanting it to happen. You know, look at Snap. I mean, it's 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 not like, oh, Google just can't do glasses. This is a really tough market. We're still trying to figure out. What the you know the special sauces that make people say I I have to have these rather than it's invasive or they're weird or they don't look normal or you know all all of those questions um, and for Google to kind of go you know we've got some internal stuff going on let's just uh, provide the guts to make you 
figure it out. Uh, and then we win anyway. That makes that that is very Google. That's what mm-hmm. works for Google. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, they, they came up with Android and the Nexus. How many Nexuses have you used lately? Not many. No, you haven't. Cause they replaced it with the pixel and now they've got the pixel fold, which, you know, is a nice phone. It's, it's, it's a oh, good look phone. Look at Tom holding a pixel fold. Well, yeah. the audio people that? can't hear that, but, uh, yes, if you're well, on video, you it. can see, see that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that I'm holding a pixel phone. Sorry, audio people. We didn't make mean to make you feel left out. Uh, but the, uh, my point is that pixel, uh, is something that is always seen as kind of a second run, right? It's a thing that's, you know, like, well, they're pretty good. They're great. They're great in certain ways. They're not better than the Galaxy. Same thing with the Pixel Fold. That's what the reviews have been with the Pixel Fold. So I feel like it's smart for Google to do what it's good at and make the Android platform. Yeah. Yep. I agree. And 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 again, this is like what they do. It makes me worry less about the Google cancel fears that we all get sometimes. Google cancels stuff sometimes. And often they're, they're software products, but when they make platforms, search platforms, phone platforms, and now an AR platform, typically they stick that stuff out and I have more trust in it. So that's the other reason I'm happy about it. Yeah. And uh, if you're not a patron, stick around on Good Day Internet. We're going to talk about that Pixel Fold a little more. Oh. Uh, folks, we need more patrons to reach our goal of getting Mollywood on the show every month. We're going to have her on this Friday. We've got enough of you uh, already to make that happen. But can we keep having her on? Uh, we need all of you who aren't already patrons to sign up right now just at the minimum amount. Just try it out for a month. Go to patreon.com slash DTNS. Do it right now. Well, Major League Baseball partnered with the biomechanics company Uplift Labs on a system to evaluate new prospects, prospects being players that somebody might want to have on their team. So Uplift Labs use two phones, iPhones, and an AI model in conjunction, replacing complicated setups with wires like an EKG. So it demonstrated it at the MLB draft combine in Arizona this month, happens, uh, you know, every year and metrics include things like kinematic sequence or stride length or ball contact timing all things that are very important and very precise especially when it comes to baseball because baseball loves a good stat that could be used to identify a flaw that a player might have maybe they're great but they've got you know there's like this one thing that they need to work on or maybe as a deal breaker injury risk based on, you know, how a player is performing. Um, It also forecasts potential. So, all right, what do we think here? Uh, A lot of people saying, oh, man, you know, what's, you know, aren't umpires good at this? Isn't that what, you know, uh, know, uh, uh, scouts are for? We accept designated hitters in the National League. American League got this some time ago. Uh, We have a pitch (laughs) clock now. But is this a ball too far, Tom Merritt? Is it insanity or just kind of smarter recruiting? Yeah, we we went from Moneyball twenty years ago to uh, to metrics uh, like uh, exit velocity and spin rate, uh, and now we're taking all of that. The, the The deal with Moneyball twenty years ago was: what if we looked at the stats and used that? to inform instead of just eyeballing things. And then all of this exit velocity and spin rate was, well, let's collect more useful stats, things that tell us more than just, you know, whether someone stole a base or not. Uh, So when we have these large language models, when we have these deep learning models that can take large amounts of data that have now been collected on folks and, and start to recognize things that we can't, that's, that's what these tools are good at is looking at large amounts of data and saying, well, you would never notice this, but I've noticed that this is true and apply it to young players to be able to get an idea, not necessarily of like, are you going to be the next Shohei Otani? Are you going to be the next major league star? But what are you good at? What are you likely to be best at? Especially when these, these folks are young and a lot of times somebody starts as a pitcher, then they get moved to a catcher or maybe to third base. Uh, This could get them on that road faster and say like, ah, with the arm strength of this person and, and the way their body moves, they would be optimized in an outfield position. Uh, so l- let's start training them there. Uh, you can also really protect their health 
by saying, you know, there's a hitch in their delivery. You might want to work on that or they're going to end up having to get Tommy John surgery on their elbow in a couple of months. Uh, so so I, I, I think this is all for the good as long as it's used for the good, right? That's always where the question ends up. So uh, this doesn't change some things. Like, for example, if a player uh, through all this deep learning they see him as just a oh, prime draft candidate. We're getting this guy. He's going to play for us this year. He's bringing him up to the farm leagues, whatever they're doing to get him. And they get him. And then he just sinks, just doesn't, doesn't work out. Terrible on, uh, on with pressure or for whatever reason, he gets on the mound in Major League Baseball and just craps out. And they got to fulfill the contract. They move him somewhere else, whatever, whatever. But then another guy can come into the league who's kind of average and they don't really have anything special to say but you put him in the limelight, suddenly that dude explodes and just everyone goes, what, where did he come from? You hear these stories all the time in all the major sports. This doesn't eliminate those possibilities, right? This just helps narrow yeah. the, the, the field. Mm -hmm. So you can have a better chance at the high performers. Yeah, I mean, if somebody's, the if someone's like, I choked. I mean, this is not going to <laughs> help that. You're not going to know that ahead of time. There's so many things that go on inside all of our heads that, you know, have, have really nothing to do with uh, what we're capable of physically. But right. I struggle to find anything that, like, weirds me out about this. Um, yeah. Maybe a different sport. Uh, maybe Maybe that would be different. Baseball is... Uh, you know, it, it is a series of, uh, you know, precision stats. It really, it, it, uh, you know, anybody who loves baseball, you, you know, either says like, well, I think it should, you know, just be, you know, you, you, you know, you call a strike and maybe the ump is wrong and that's the way it is. Okay. Well, that's an old school way of doing things. Um, but we're kind of in a new era and I feel like, yeah, as far as uh, potential injuries to players, um, where there could be something that uh, wasn't seen beforehand, um, that this this could help uh, and minimize those injuries. Um, or, you know, yeah, otherwise just having somebody kind of bounced around, you know, in playing the wrong position. Uh, I, I would think as a player, uh, even if <laughs> you don't necessarily like what you hear, um, more information about what you're actually good at and where you should play is best for everybody. Well, then it can be right. But the danger, what I was alluding to earlier is what Sineric just uh, said in the chat room. What happens when they find a major issue with the AI and someone misses out on a contract? Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it'll be a major issue with the AI. I think people exaggerate like, oh, they say this AI is good and it's not. But what happens when someone uh, is screened by the AI and gets drafted later? Uh, you know, th those are things that are already a, a, an issue with pre-draft physicals. Right now, if a player submits to a pre-draft physical, he's insured to receive at least 75% of the slot value as a signing bonus. So there's some protection for that to say, look, you know, we don't want someone using this against you. There needs to be some protections for this too, to say this should be used for health. It should be used for proper coaching and development. It should not be used as a way to drive down what you pay people. Well, composer Ryuichi Sakamoto passed away in March, but the Grammy and Oscar winner's final performance as a pianist is available through a Magic Leap 2 headset, but there's a little bit more to it. So in a 45-minute performance, Sakamoto plays 10 of his own compositions. At the end of every piece, people clap, but those people weren't actually there because this didn't actually take place, at least not in the way that you see it through the magic leap. This is a mixed reality show. It's making the rounds, global rounds in museums and festivals, um, getting a lot of accolades. The show starts with 80 people sitting in a circle around nothing until they put on that magic leap to headset, at which point Sakamoto appears in the center of the circle and starts to play. Now, Kagami, the Japanese word for mirror, was designed by Tin Drum. That's a production studio crea uh, which created a 3D model of Sakamoto in November of 2020. That was in Tokyo, and that was during a very, very locked down time in the world, particularly in Japan. So at the time, it was one of only two cities in the world uh, that the production studio uh, felt had the setup necessary to capture Sakamoto in 3D and generate a virtual model of him using volumetric and motion capture tech. Three days and 48 cameras later, 
Sakamoto's final performance was captured. And if you happen to be in a city or an area where this is coming through, um, people are raving about it. Sounds pretty cool. Yeah. This is so cool. Um, I I just became familiar with Sakamoto because he collaborated with August D on a song on D-Day, which is an album that just came out a couple months ago. And it was one of the last things he did uh, yeah. was was to play on that. And then I started learning about his career, which is incredibly impressive. And his yeah. foresight to be willing to do this to, because he had a terminal disease. He, he knew he didn't have long to be like, let's, let's make it so that my music can continue with me playing it for people after the fact. This is, this is so cool. If yeah, you have if never anyone, heard any- the, 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 sorry, I was going to say, if you never heard the soundtrack to the Revenant 2015's the Revenant with Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio, one of the most amazing soundtracks ever. He did that one, won Oscars for it and stuff at the time. But if you've never heard it on its own, even without the film, Amazing. Breathtaking. So good. Yeah. If anyone has either experienced this or plans to, we would mm. love to hear about it. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. In fact, let's check the old mailbag right now. Well, let's do it. Uh, in response to our conversation yesterday about who exactly the Mac Pro is still for when Apple has robust and cheaper options, TJ wrote in and said, video production. TJ says, the Mac Pro is ideal for people involved in video or audio production. The internal PC, uh, PCIe slots allow the user to add deck link video playback cards or Dante sound cards and keep everything in one chassis without needing a separate external enclosure for each card. This allows for a much smaller physical footprint that is more robust. It also frees up the Thunderbolt ports for other peripherals. There are a lot of people associated with Alex Lindsay's Office Hours show that are very excited about the Mac Pro and its possibilities. It's good to hear from a Mac Pro fan. Uh, thank you, TJ, uh, for writing in. Uh, Monica Shin should have talked to y'all, is my response, because she mentions several video editors that she talked to, uh, and they were all fine with a MacBook or with a Windows machine in some cases uh, because of the flexibility and because they're still mad about what Apple did to Final Cut years ago. Uh, so it's good to know there's some folks out there that are still very excited. Th- thanks for writing in, TJ. Indeed. And thanks to you, Scott Johnson, for being with us today. Let folks know what is your latest. Well, uh, if you like video game coverage and you like more than just, hey, video games are cool, right? Uh, you want to hear about the industry, what's going on in this uh, these hearings with Microsoft and Sony at the ver- at this very moment uh, and what those mean to their acquisition of Activision Blizzard, those kinds of heavy issues and that video games are cool. You can check us out on the show called Core. That happens every Thursday night and goes up as a podcast right after. Check out all the details for live show and more at frogpants.com slash core. All right, patrons, stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. Uh, we've got my report on the Amazon Astro robot that has been rolling around my house, frightening my dog for the past 12 hours. Uh, okay. We have my first impressions of the Pixel Fold. I just unboxed it before the show. And we're going to play that frustrating password game that is taking the internet by storm. That's all on Good Day Internet. Patrons, stick around. Just a reminder, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Yeah, we're live every day. We'll be back tomorrow with Dr. Nikki talking about black hole detection through the observation of gravity waves. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>